Hey everybody, Coach here. Man, thanks for taking a couple of minutes. I appreciate your time and I hope you get a little something out of this. Hey, this particular week we're talking about color chasing. It's a term that you may not have heard of, but you will learn as we go through this video. Hey, if you haven't already, please hit the, hit the subscribe button for me. Let's grow this channel a little, little bit bigger. Maestro and I really wanted to get to 5,000 by the end of the year. I don't know if we're going to do it, but every little bit helps. So if you're not a subscriber and you happen to stumble across the channel, just hit the subscribe button. It's free. It's not going to cost you nothing. And hit a like at the end. That way the channel will grow, and it has. I'm so proud of it this year. I'm just like a new daddy. Hey, I am a big fan, a big, big fan of color in the landscape. Whether it be a residential, commercial, or even Ma Nature's landscape, I love seeing color out there. It adds so much more visual interest, a lot of pop, attraction, and pleasure when viewing the landscape at any time of the year. Well, at least nine months out of the year. And that's what we're going to strive for today. Many landscapes are very, very consistent with the monochromatic green. Green trees, green lawn, sometimes even a green house, and it's okay but there are more depths and visual pleasures that can come out of having color in the landscape. And that's what we're here for this week. So I'm glad you're here. Join us for the rest of the video. I won't take any more than 30 minutes of your time. Let's get rolling. You know, color chasing was a term that was uh, given to me by a college professor many, many years ago in landscape design. And when he described it, it basically boiled down to getting it as early as you can in the year and ending it as late as you can in the year, if you enjoy color. And it comes in many, many forms and fashions, as you'll learn this week. But chasing it, chasing it takes a little bit of... Uh, little bit of due diligence and research, it really does. It will also depend on where you are located. Sometimes growing seasons don't start till May. Sometimes they start in February. And for you, you will have to know. You'll have to know when things get off and running, what USDA zone, your growing zone you're in, and what will work for you in the soils that you have. So it does take a little bit of homework. I know, some of you out there who have zero to very little patience are going to say, hey, Coach Matt, you mean I got to go through all this crap just to find out how much flower and color I can put in my landscape? Well, yes and no. All depends on how successful you want to be. First of all, chasing color comes in in many forms. It comes in flower color, which most people think of right out of the get-go. And it also comes in leaf color, stem color, bark color, and art color that we can introduce into the landscape. So some of the decisions, some of the considerations you have to make is, do you want to bite off one big chunk of ornamental horticulture and research it for a month or so and come up? Or do you want to nibble your way through winter and do little bits of research and garnering information so that next spring you can get out there and start this process? Whichever way it is, I really suggest that you take a whole season or two to introduce this color chasing phenomenon into your ornamental landscape. Maybe you want to have flower color. Flower color is easily attained. You can go to the nursery, you can go to a box store, you can go to Walmart and pick up petunias. That really is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a combination of many factors, starting off with early spring bulbs, early spring flowering trees, then migrating off into spring perennials, spring annuals, rolling over into early summer with other choices, even summer bulbs, and then chasing color all the way through the heat of the summer, rounding the corner into fall, and then enjoying fall with all its mystique and leaf color, and even, depending on where you live, even some great fall and winter plantings, such as calendula, pansies, violas, uh, trisomic stock, snapdragons and other ones that if you're in the right zone you could have put those in and now you're approaching 10 months out of the year usually depending on where you live one of the easiest ways that i generally suggest is 
get off the couch after you've done your research and get out to those nurseries and get out to the nursery at various times of the year. If you get out there in February for say zones eight and above, February is a key month when everything starts coming in. They do it right after inventory of the previous leftover stock and then the new stuff hits the tables. It hits the racks. Now, if you're up north, maybe that stuff doesn't roll in until April. And I've seen some northerly latitude nurseries that are just getting fully stocked in early May. You have to know your particular area and you have to know your nursery as well. That's why it's really good to go in there and ask for some help and develop a good working relationship with some of the professionals at your local nurseries. And it doesn't have to be just one. Maybe you have a couple, two or three. Then you have a first name basis that you can go in and say, this is what I'm looking to do. This is when I want to do it. How can you help me out? And most of the time, if they're worth their salt, they'll tell you and they'll tell you when stuff is going to be coming in. Makes it a lot easier. Make sure you write some of this stuff down. If you're not good at designing, it's okay. You can either hire a designer to do this for you, or you can just kind of mix and match it as you see fit out there. But don't buy $1,500 worth of plant material and not know what you're going to do with it. Your research and your due diligence that you've put into this will tell you where the short stuff goes in the front of the beds, mid-bed, backdrop, trees, shade, sun, etc. And it'll come out with a professional result because you planned it out and you designed it out and you know in your head how it's going to look when it's all said and done. So color mixing is a popular way of really adding an additional chapter of visual appreciation and visual pop to your landscape. Most of the time, people are oriented through the color wheel to either warmer colors or cooler colors. But a really great way to color chase throughout the warmer growing seasons is to have a mixture of both. So you have a great, great contrast, like purples and yellows, whites and purples, reds and yellows. Here's a for instance, if you want to start off your spring, is to have some mid-season daffodils. Mid-season daffodils with a white and yellow or a yellow, and then have a burgundy Japanese maple above it and in backdrop. And then you have this bright yellow tapestry, maybe even with some smaller bulbs down in there like crocus or hyacinths and other type of coolers. And then you have this bright burgundy, burgundy maple that's coming out. A very, very show-stopping piece of landscape art. So tie them all together. You know, you have a, uh, a blooming period of trees, shrubs, and bulbs most of the time in early spring. Roll that over into some annuals and some perennials coming in. I used to love a warmer color of yellow through the Dwarf Biden collection. Those guys were fantastic, and I did them in a couple places in the backyard of Wheat Patch Ranch, and they really filled nice under a what? Burgundy maple, and it really looked good for, oh, I don't know, probably 10 months out of the year until the maple dropped its leaves, and then it continued. It continued all the way in zone nine throughout the year. The bloom wasn't quite as profuse. I had to go in and nip and tuck it and give it a little food and burst it, but it was there almost 12 months out of the year. And I really appreciated that one particular perennial. So if you take out a, uh, you take out a piece of paper and you're sitting in front of your computer and you start Googling and getting into some of the more uh, horticulture sites that are out there. So you can time this so you know what is coming in at the beginning of a month what is going out and coming in at the end and beginning of each month. And you can almost time it, not necessarily to the day, because every year is a little different, but generally right around a week or two week spread where the new stuff has come in, you've enjoyed it, they're starting to fade and you're gonna pay attention to deadheading and wrapping up bulbs and doing whatever you do, while the second chapter, and then the third chapter, and then the fourth chapter, all the way through, all the way up until the holidays. That's why we call it color chasing. And once you put it in and you get a season or two of planting in there, you'll see exactly what I mean. And you'll really enjoy your labor of love and your labor efforts in there. So will the rest of the neighborhood, especially if you do a front yard project. A real quick and simple way to bridge gaps should you have uh, 
a couple three weeks or so between perennials and summer bulbs and fall color etc is always use annuals and you can use annuals in containers or in beds and they are kind of the stop gap they're the fillers between one season to another remember annuals are going to go to seed if you take an annual like alyssum if you let it go all the way through its cycle and let it go to seed it's going to be there for several years afterwards because it will regenerate itself what I used to find is you go in there and kind of give it a haircut and knock off the, the seed forming part of alyssum and then it'll pop back again for you. And you'll generally get two to three blooms before it goes, I'm done. But try alyssum, you can try lobelia, you can try some of the, the million dollar bells, the calabracoa and things like that. These things really, really add a lot of pop throughout your growing season and then bridge that gap between one big bang of perennials and bulbs and tree color, etc., to the next. Keep in mind your ground cover selections too. Many times, uh, perennial ground covers, they're gonna have their blooming period. If you look at things like ajuga and thyme, uh, ruchia, ice plant, trailing African daisy, gazania, all of these guys have their blooming period. And so you can plan bulbs and annuals and then ground covers and have kind of a uh, carpeted ground level tapestry that is also very interesting. And then the more vertical stuff will come in later on. What I really encourage is making sure that you stay on the maintenance so that you can extend various seasons of various perennials or annuals by feeding and deadheading. Yeah. It's the tedious part of color chasing, but you gotta do it if you like to uh, make sure that those particular tapestries roll from one season or one month to the next, and you can extend it out. Most of the time you can get two and three blooms or more by just paying attention to it a little bit. And it doesn't take all day. You can go out for an hour maybe on a Saturday morning right after you get done with the lawn and go in and do some feeding and do some deadheading and extend your dollar. Another thing is, is when it comes to perennials, many of them, especially right before dormancy, you can go in and divide. You can make a big purchase one particular year, let them grow for a couple of years, and then in the late fall, you can go in and divide those into twos, threes, or fours, and propagate them to other parts of the yard or give them to friends. It's like having free plants, and you won't even know that you've done it by mid next year it'll be as big and as prolific as it was before you chopped it in threes you know as we round the corner from summer into fall it's a great time of year to have particular perennials like autumn joy sedums dragon blood sedums um, some of the asters rudbeckia all of these guys are late summer into fall and you can generally pump them up and have them go all the way into October and November, depending on your particular area, and then your fall annuals, right in conjunction with whenever your tree selections start to go blaze. Blaze golds, reds, and oranges, and that becomes a really, really, really pretty landscape. And then when everything starts to fall and you rake it up, you know, you still have some of those perennials that are hanging on. And maybe you have to tuck them in and say goodnight for the winter when the first snows hit, and that's okay. Another thing is, is depending on your uh, level of toleration, that is, is you can let all the, the perennial die back and everything. Just let it sit there. Let it sit there and, and let it protect the root zones and let the snow insulate them. You don't need to go in and cut everything down to the ground, especially if you're in a real cold area. Insulate those beds a little bit. Mulch them before Thanksgiving so they have a little more root insulation area and they will thank you tremendously next year without having to be frozen to death and try to come back and please you in the springtime. Now I know I'm talking to a lot of people, uh, th this is really kind of northern hemisphere specific, but you guys in the southern hemisphere can enjoy the same things. It's just a different time of year. It's your normal down there. It's not normal for us in the Northern Hemisphere, but do it when your winter, spring, summer, and fall for you guys are down there. You know, color chasing is really, it's really a passion. And the more uh, in depth you get into it, the better your landscape is gonna be. If you approach it in a half-assed manner, you're gonna get half-assed results. 
So make it a labor of love and take a few hours every week and do some research. Find out what colors really trip your trigger, what really grows well in your area, and how do you need to amend your soils so you get the best results. If you live in an area where a shovel can't even get in the ground unless it's a bulldozer or an excavator type of thing, then maybe you have to go raised beds and container type of plantings. You can still get a lot of bang for your buck using that particular avenue of landscaping. Colors in containers, colors in raised beds, etc. Now, for some of you, some of you, uh, no, not the trolls, even though I do appreciate trolls once in a while, but you have to remember that if you go native and you love the native colors of your particular region, just be aware that if you actually go out and purchase them and put them in your landscape, native perennials, native grasses, native trees and everything are predisposed in doing a couple of things. One is procreation, the other one is proliferation. And with that, you have to remember to deadhead. Make sure that once you've got your bloom, then get rid of it. Don't let it go to seed. The last thing you want is to plant uh, a series of three whatevers that bloom really pretty in May and June in your particular area and you forget, you forget to deadhead them and pretty soon you have those all over the backyard. There was an ornamental grass uh, for many years. It was very popular out where I was practicing. It was steepa grass, Mexican feather reed grass. And that stuff, if people did not get on deadheading, they had just a whole yard full of steepa grass eventually. So be careful, be careful and know what you're getting, both the pros and the cons. So depending on where you live, maybe you can get uh, nine months worth of color chasing in your landscape. But what do you do during that three months? Well, as I've said before, you can use that time for number one thing, and that is rest. Rest yourself. Let the landscape rest. You've busted your butt for much of the year to make sure it looks as good as you possibly can. Give yourself a break. Once you've rested up, use the latter part of the winter to start planning and prepping. You can do things like tool maintenance, uh, power equipment maintenance. Maybe you're gonna add some more stuff and you've done some mail order. Maybe you have a particular spot of your house where you can do some starts in cell packs. You can plant seeds, etc. And then once the snows melt, once the rains stop, once the ground dries to a manageable level, you can get out there and start it all over again. It is one of the best hobbies that you can possibly have. And have you ever seen something where the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. That's Ornamental Horticulture 101. If there's anything I can leave you with, I'll leave you with this. If, if you find something that does not work, do not leave it in the landscape. Take it out, chalk it up to learning curve, and try something different. Look around in the various nurseries. 90% of them generally carry stuff that works in your area. Not always the box stores, not always Walmart, but the professional mom and pop nurseries, you do have professionals there that know what work and they know how they can get things to work for you based on the soil conditions and the environment that you're in. So use those professionals and then patronize them. Guys, that's what I have for you this week. Before you leave me, before you click off, before you've hit that like button, I really encourage you to join the Yard Coach crew, hitting the join button and looking into it. For a couple measly dollars a month, you'll have additional education. And if you have a project coming up, maybe you wanna bump up that membership just enough, you have a landscape consultant available to you as you get through that project. Don't forget the website. Make sure you take a look at that uh, digital course that I have and the ebook. I always have the 15 stepper for you. Hope you got a little something out of this. Color chasing is a passion of mine for decades now, and I hope you find it as enjoyable as I have found it. Guys, I'll see you next week. As always, to your landscape success, take care and bye for now.